A warm welcome to all of you. I am Dr. Komal Chavan, Chairperson, Foxy Medical Disorders in Pregnancy Committee. Month of May is the Preeclampsia Awareness Month, and 22nd May is the World Preeclampsia Day. Incidence of preeclampsia is 10 percent, and some cases progress to the dreadful complication of eclampsia. Early detection and treatment is the key. So to raise awareness. for this severe and dangerous pregnancy complication this year 2020 the campaign slogan is act early screen early foxy medical disorders in pregnancy committee launched a survey on this 22nd may focusing on common practice in management of preeclampsia by the obstetricians i request all of you to spare 2 minutes to complete the survey so we can have our own results about the practices what is going on and can learn from the trends which are going on in the various teaching institutes private colleges and uh, the medical colleges so before i invite my co moderator i thank president foxy dr alpesh kandi secretary general dr jaydeep tang vice president in charge dr atul ganatra team tog science integra and our pharma partners mayo vita biotics now i call upon the as moderator none other than dr niranjan chavan he is the professor and the unit chief of ltmgh sayan hospital uh, and having a teaching experience of almost 22 years and he has been very active in this lockdown time doing a lot of work delivering a lot of covid positive patients he is also the vice president of mumbai obstetrics and gynec society secretary general of maharashtra chapter of iag over to you dr niranjan chavan thank you dr komal chavan it's a pleasure welcome all of you india asia europe uk as i say age has no barriers and we have with us esteemed panelists from india and none other than dr professor sir arul kumaran who is going to be live with us today it will be a historical live transmission of dr arul kumaran who is loved and appreciated all over india and i call upon our esteemed panelist and we have today dr p k shah he is the doyan of gynecological obstetric ultrasound in india and a professor and unit head in the department of obstetrics and gynecology said gs medical college and km hospital we all know him as the past foxy president iag president and mogs president and he was also the dean of ifm u b we all know sir is a very great academician and his field of interest is high risk obstetrics thank you dr pk shah sir to be with us today it's an honor to have such seniors on this platform and we have the next eminent obstetrician the iron lady from south india dr shanta kumari she is frcpi and frcog uk we all know her as the lady who manages all the conferences in south of india beautiful place the biryani state of india hyderabad madam welcome thank you for giving your precious time today we have with us dr jaydeep tang he is the coolest doc he can speak on any subject a very intellectual person an academician and the immediate past president of mogs currently he holds the position of secretary general of federation of obstetrics and gynecological societies of india and he is also the deputy secretary general of AO fog he is consultant at ashwini hospital and is field of interest is infertility and and he practices obstetrics he is the program director and member of board of profort ibf he has done more than 3500 ipl ibf cycles annually across the 15 ibf centers welcome dr jaydeep ta thank you sir. Now I request Dr. Jairi to please take over the program 
and start and introduce and welcome Dr. Sabaratanam Arul Kumaran. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ranjan, and thank you particularly for asking me to introduce Prof. Arul. I have always said that if you want to run out of adjectives, you should try and introduce Prof. Arul Kumaran. He is truly the golden man with a common touch. After training in Colombo and then rising through the ranks at the National University of Singapore to head the department, he moved to the UK. He is now the Foundation Professor of ONG, University of Nicosia, Professor Emeritus of ONG, St. George's University of London, and a visiting professor at the Institute of Global Health, Imperial College, London. In a glittering academic career, he has been the former president of FIGO, the British Medical Association, and the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. He's had an amazing academic contribution in the form of over 300 publications, 28 books, 164 book chapters. He is a member of the National Academy of Sciences in the USA and the honorary fellow of 12 national societies. In recognition of services to medicine, he was made Knight Bachelor by Her Majesty the Queen in the birthday honors list of June 2009 and his citation, which was most apt for him read, the most forward thinking medical leader in the country. I'm sure that all of us who are fortunate enough to know Prof. Arul come away after meeting him feeling better about ourselves. I don't know what meeting all of us does to him, but that is the person he is. Ladies and gentlemen, I proudly give you Prof. Sir Sabratna Arul Kumaran, our man for all seasons. Prof, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jadi, for the kind introduction. Uh, I wish I can be close to you. I can see a coconut palm waving right behind you. <laughs> uh, well, it's nice to see all my good friends and uh, Niranjan and Komal. Thank you for inviting me. And also nice to see PK Shah and Shantakumari and uh, Jadi uh, joining the case discussion subsequently. So if I may ask for my first slide. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, hypertensive disease in pregnancy, the current status and future concerns, because uh, uh, as you know, at the moment, we are all locked up in the COVID environment, but we have a long future. So we had to really look at what are the future issues with hypertensive disease. Next slide. So, the magnitude of the problem initially is about 10%. It varies from country to country and place to place, but on an average, it varies between 6 to 10%. And when we say hypertensive disease, it includes gestational hypertension, which comes during pregnancy and goes off. But we can't ignore that because on long-term consequences, they also suffer the same fate like those who have preeclampsia. So gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, eclampsia and chronic hypertension in pregnancy. They all clump together, but we had to distinguish one from the other because there is slight subtle differences in terms of maternal and perinatal outcome. So what I'm going to really focus in the next 20 or 30 minutes is two areas. One is about prediction, whether we can prevent the hypertensive disease coming. And this is, has been a, a subject of long discussion for decades, but let us see what is it available at the moment in the literature? And secondly, about long-term consequences. What are these long-term consequences and why should they happen? And can we avoid that? Next slide. So this is in a nutshell, the classification. If some woman gets a blood pressure below 20 weeks, then it is most likely due to an underlying disorder. It could be an endocrine disorder. It could be some other antiphospholipid syndrome, some other problem, but they won't have proteinuria. But if they are under 20 weeks and present with proteinuria, then it's most likely they got renal disease, glomerular nephritis. So you have to really check for that and make sure that they don't have underlying renal disorder because their prognosis on the long run is also very poor. Just to mention that we have our glomerular filtration rate at 120 mils per minute. And uh, when you look at the age, once you pass 20, the glomerular filtration rate drops by a milliliter per year. So if you have 40 years, 
then your mm -hmm. glomerular filtration becomes 100. So if you take about living for 60 years, that means it comes to about half, but still to get renal failure, you, your glomerulation filtration has to drop to 15 or 20 ml. But if they have renal disease, it drops drastically and they run into problems. So if anybody comes as a pregnant mother with protein uric hypertension, under 20 weeks, she needs investigation. She needs lifelong involvement on measuring the blood pressure and also estimated glomerular filtration rate so you can treat her in time and warn her before she goes into precipitate failure. The next area is gestational hypertension. That means there are no protein urea and over 20 weeks. And as I mentioned, their risk of cardiovascular and cerebrovascular problems are also similar, but much less extent compared to preeclampsia on the long run. So we had to keep a note of them because they also need long-term follow-up. Preeclampsia is defined as a blood pressure over 20 weeks with significant proteinuria, which is more than 300 milligram per 24 hours or two plus, over two plus in a dipstick. Next slide. So the definition as it is, it was revised in the May 2020, even in the ACOG guidelines, it's the same as before that if a person gets a blood pressure, the woman gets a blood pressure of 140 over 90, either systolic 140 or diastolic 90, after 20 weeks on two separate occasions, four hours apart, then they are supposed to have hypertension. But if they have a severe hypertension, you don't wait for two readings. With a single reading, you conclude that she has hypertensive disease because she needs uh, urgent treatment. And if they have significant proteinuria, or other end organ disease, even if they have non, no protein urea, but if their liver function deranged or uh, clotting disorders, then they would be classed as preeclampsia. Now, edema is a common thing, so we can't take that seriously unless they have sacral edema or facial edema. That means in non-dependent parts, then that is of significance. Next slide, please. So the diagnosis is by a mercury sphygmomanometry. We don't have that, but we normally have electronic, but ideally it should be calibrated to see whether it reads very well with mercury manometers. But the most important thing is to look at the correct size cuff, because if you put a, uh, in a woman who is a big maid, if you put a small cuff, then it is going to uh, give a low reading instead of the accurate reading. And secondly, to remember about atypical manifestations, even with normal blood pressure. So when you do a routine blood test, if the platelets are low, then there might be a problem and one has to think about preeclampsia. Next slide. Now, the etiology is not completely known, unknown. Uh, so it's supposed to be due to disorder in placentation, which is due to trophoblast invasion, completing its invasion by 15 to 60 weeks. And uh, the secondary part seems to be a systemic vasospasm. So due to a proper placentation, because the, uh, we'll show you by diagram later, the systemic small vessel abnormalities or microangiopathy is increased. And uh, there is endothelial cell wall activation. And there also platelets tend to clump and clot and form microthrombus and has minor infarction and petechial hemorrhage. So it's a microangiopathy. And also there is a systemic vasospasm, which causes labile hypertension. Labile meaning it can be 140, 90 now, it can be 160, 100 later on. Uh, that is due to the vessels going into spasm. Increased capillary permeability is also a feature and also because of the hemodilution effect, the protein gets diluted and they can leak fluid outside with a high blood pressure. Both can complement each other. Next slide. So we would call it as two-stage disorder. Stage one is the placental disorder, which means there is poor invasion of trophoblast into a decidual and myometrial bed. And stage two is a maternal response. And the maternal response seems to be very complex. It is, seems to be something to do with immunology, uh, something to do with genetic, and there seems to be a play by a number of factors involved because we know 
people like antiphospholipid syndrome and so forth get, and also there are in ruts in families that the mother or sister had. So there's a genetic component as well. Next slide. So stage one is to do with uh, in normal pregnancy, the highly contractile spiral arteries in Destock, base Alice, and myometrium are remodeled by the invasion of the trophoblast. And uh, these result in wide bore, low resistance vessels supplying a large amount of maternal blood to the retroplacental area so the baby can get enough nutrition, adequate fetal nutrition and oxygen supply. Failure to do so result in hypertension. This seems to be that by raising the blood pressure, you can force the blood into the retroplacental circulation. Next slide. So that is the diagram, the normal pregnancy. We can see the trophoblast invading the decidu and part of the myometrium making into open channels. But those who are preeclampsia, the invasion is not very complete compared to the non-pregnant on the extreme end. So that gives a diagrammatic impression of what happens. Next slide. And this is represented when someone does first or second trimester Doppler flow on the uterine vessel, they have notches or reduced endastolic flows. So that will give some indication as to whether this woman is more likely to develop the preeclamptic process much later on. If they don't develop preeclampsia, there's a possibility they might develop intrauterine growth restriction. Next slide. So, the stage two is really the maternal endothelial dysfunction. There is an intravascular inflammatory response. There is the clotting system is activated and there is permeability in capillaries. And there's also reduced intravascular volume. And the balance between the vasodilatory prostacycline and vasoconstrictory thromboxane. Now these prostacycline and thromboxane prostaglandin products are produced by the platelets as well as the endothelial cell walls. And predominantly, the endothelial cell walls produce prostacycline, which is vasodilator, whereas platelets, when it is clumped and breaks, then it releases thromboxane, which is vasoconstrictor. And the low-dose aspirin inhibits this process of the platelets clumping and breaking down and giving rise to raised blood pressure. And this affects tags in the portal system now, if the aspirin dose is made too much, then it might inhibit the COX enzyme in the endothelial cells as well, and that balance will not be maintained. So it has to be low dose. The American college feels anything from 75 to 150 milligram is okay, and currently 150 milligram seems to be the accepted dose, and especially taken in the nights, it seems to have a better effect. Next slide. So this is the two-stage disorder, and the placental disorder, by releasing powerful vasoconstrictors like the soluble FLIT1 and cytokines, causes the vasospasm. So it starts very earlier on locally, and uh, the stage two, the maternal response, as you mentioned, is the ones we, I mentioned about leaky capillaries, vasospasm, which affects the number of organs kidneys, liver, uh, heart, brain, any organ can be affected by this process. Next slide. The problem with this multi-system disorder are three things. Number one, we don't know which organ will be first affected. It was standard practice and understanding that the kidneys are the ones to be first affected, but we don't know because sometimes there's no proteinuria but there is liver manifestations and CNS manifestations or coagulation manifestation. The second thing is we don't know which other organs would be affected. For example, if we get proteinuria, we don't know whether the liver will get affected, the clotting will get affected and so forth. Thirdly, we don't know how quickly the organ functions would deteriorate. So once we see proteinuria or abnormal liver function test, we have to keep the woman under constant monitoring to make sure uh, other organs are not getting affected, and the organ which is affected is not deteriorating badly. Next slide. So going back to the stage one, stage two, the placental disorder, if it is severe, not only it will give rise to preeclampsia, but also to intrauterine growth restriction, 
And earlier, the preeclampsia, there is more organ dysfunction like the liver and the kidney. Whereas if the placental disorder of a milder form, then they get to get term preeclampsia, which is also milder form. They don't get affected so badly. They need delivery by 37, 38 weeks, but uh, they don't get badly affected with growth restriction and other kidney liver derangement. Next slide. So early onset versus late onset has to be kept in mind. And anyone who develops preeclampsia before 30 week, 34 weeks is considered as early and after 34 is late onset. And uh, abnormal placental development seems to be the uh, associated with early onset, whereas late onset should be due to maternal response and maternal genetic disposition, which characterizes the late preeclampsia. The next one. So in early preterm pregnancy, the baby and the mother experience more complications. Uh, there are intrapartum maternal complications and the preeclampsic process is more severe. But lifelong complication to the newborn and the mother is also much greater if there are preterm preeclampsia. So not only growth restriction, but the mothers can get diabetes and also the newborns when they grow older, uh, in an early stage, they can develop diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, and so on. This is well known as fetal origins of adult disease, but the, that can be precipitated by um, the preeclamptic process appearing early. Next slide. Now, the reason why people are searching to reduce the incidence of preterm preeclampsia is because of these long-term consequences to the mother and the, and the fetus, because the baby also, when they grow up, will have difficulties. So this is uh, one slide from 2012, which shows that preterm preeclampsia, once you give aspirin, can be reduced remarkably compared to the control incidence. Uh, whereas in the term preeclampsia, there doesn't seem to be much influence, but that doesn't affect the fetus or the mother so drastically like the preterm preeclampsia. Next slide. Mm. So in a nutshell, if you want to give some risk calculation, then you have to identify individual risk. For example, genetic factors. The mother had PET, then 20 to 25% chance the woman will get preeclampsia. The sisters had that 35 to 40%. Obstetric factors, primary parity, adolescent pregnancy, multiple pregnancy, and uh, medical factors like pre-existing hypertension, renal disease, obesity, diabetes, antiphospholipid, they all can give rise to uh, preeclampsia. So it can give a certain risk factor. What are the chances of woman getting preeclampsia if she has pre-existing hypertension and so forth? Next slide. So there have been studies done to evaluate the risk core or clinical risk factor. For example, a nulliparous woman, a woman over age of 40, a family history of preeclampsia, previous preeclampsia, high BMI, chronic hypertension, IVF itself has some risk, and maternal mood anxiety disorders and so on. So you can give a cumulative risk factor. Same woman might have higher chance of getting preeclampsia if she's nulliparous, over 40, has a high BMI and so on. So in our clinical practice, we have to not only take one factor, but the number of key factors involved in making the woman getting preeclampsia. Next slide. Now, the other one which is commonly used is the uterine artery Doppler, as I mentioned, but it seems to have low positive predictive value for term preeclampsia, but for preterm preeclampsia, the Doppler done at 20 to 23, 23 weeks seem to perform very well. So I think if uh, one has the facility to do a uterine artery Doppler, that'll be a useful thing. Next slide. So that is the uterine artery Doppler showing a notching. Next one. Now, the ones which are commonly used are, as I mentioned, past family of medical history, genetic factors, uh, Doppler we mentioned. There are two other elements which are used in different hospitals and different settings. One is mean arterial pressure. The second is biochemical parameters. And I put an advertisement for Perkin Elmer, who has a machine where you take the blood 
and put it through the machine and it'll give you all the biochemical parameters. And they claim that uh, they can detect preeclampsia by doing these biochemical parameters. Next slide. So the mean arterial pressure, you have to make sure the woman is in a seated position at rest for five minutes. And the cuff size is given small 22 centimeter breadth or normal is 22 to 32 and large is 33 to 42. So it's actually depending on the arm circumference or obesity of the woman, sometimes you have to select the cuff size. Once you're rested for five minutes, you take a recording and then every minute you take a recording and provided that the reading difference is less than 10 millimeter, you take the systolic and diastolic blood pressure from both arms and uh, take the last two measurements and take the highest of the mean arterial pressure you get. That seems to have some predictive value. So of course, in a clinic setting, you might not be able to do all this. Once you're reading, if it is high, then you might want to take another reading and uh, check the, well, the, the systolic and diastolic blood pressure. If it is already high, in early pregnancy, then she's more likely to develop preeclampsia or gestational hypertension. Next slide. Uh, biomarkers, there's a combined screening available based on placental-derived peptides. Uh, Pregnancy-associated plasma protein or plasma protein 13 are reduced. The levels are reduced in those who are likely to develop preeclampsia because the placenta is not developed, so it's not secreting the same amount of placental proteins. Next slide. This is a study from Akolka who has done uh, an analysis of the predicted rate of preeclampsia under 34 weeks, under 37 weeks, and after 37 weeks. And taking into consideration the history along with these biochemical markers. And the last column, if you read, the biochemical markers, uterine artery Doppler and mean arterial pressure, if you put everything together, the prediction rate seems to be high. So if you have the facilities, you can do that. But the American College of ONG has even recently, as this month, has predicted that maybe the additional advantage other than the history with medical genetic factors put together, the percentage may not be high, but nevertheless, I think we have to pay consideration because if you look at the first column and the last column, there seems to be a significant difference as to when you do a combined biochemical analysis. Next slide. Now, the new story is about what people call it as soluble FLIT1, which is a splice variant of vascular endothelial growth factor 1. And that is a powerful vasoconstrictor. So there are attempts made now to measure split one and split one has been shown to be elevated in pregnant with women within five weeks of blood pressure going up. So if a bedside machine comes by, whether you can really measure the real culprit, which influences indirectly the other parameters, then that might be the way to go in uh, predicting who is likely to get uh, preeclampsia. Next slide. So the story as it is, if we want to recap, there are a number of people who have been looking at it. And uh, interestingly, the second paper they I have marked, first trimester maternal ophthalmic artery Doppler analysis for production of pre preeclampsia. Because even in the ophthalmic artery, they have shown a uh, diastolic flow similar to the uterine artery flow. So there's a big question mark about whether it's the uterine artery blood flow is the chief problem or whether that could be other things. But all these papers, especially from Australia, Sean Bernicke's group from the last three papers there, indicates that when the Australians did the same biochemical markers, they didn't get the same predictive value or predictivity compared to the English researchers. So there seems to be some more work needed about combined biochemical analysis, but also to focus on SFLIP1 to see whether that could be the only marker. Next slide. This is uh, from 2013, but as I mentioned, even uh, this month, there had been a bulletin from American College, and they say neither first trimester serology screening nor second trimester uterine artery Doppler were clinically useful in predicting preeclampsia 
on low risk population. I also would go one step further and without some proven effective intervention beyond we already have, implementing a screening test for preeclampsia is minimal to no use. So it has some skepticism about all the other things we have other than history. But I think in a country like India, where the biochemical test might be far off unless it's in a cosmopolitan big cities, uh, it is reasonable to educate obstetricians and midwives to focus on clinical parameters and mean arterial pressure. Next slide. Now, we are worried about preeclampsia because of these complications like the HELP syndrome, which can affect the liver, mm -hmm. cause hemolysis and so on, placental abruption, disseminate intravascular coagulation problem, renal problem, pulmonary edema, aspiration, maternal death. So there is enough grounds to see whether we can lower the chance of getting these complications. And lower the chance means those who are less than 34 weeks and get preeclampsia had the high chance of getting these complications. So low-dose aspirin is quite an important one. And also in some countries, lack of calcium can give rise to preeclampsia. And that also becomes an important intervention. And then early detection. So prevention and early detection must be the uh, goals we should have to avoid preeclampsia. Next one. So that is actually just to show growth restriction and perinatal mortality can be high, prematurity can be high because of the growth restriction. Next slide. This is a diagrammatic fashion, how the various of spasm cause hypertension, hypertensive encephalopathy, cerebral bleed, or affecting the kidney renal failure, or liver hepatic disruption, or lungs, pulmonary edema, and thrombocytopenia. So it can affect any organ because of vasospasm and endothelial disruption and microclot formation. Next slide. This is on the fetal. Again, you can see reduced placental transfer give rise to hypoxia. The hepatic glycogen stores are not formed, so reduced abdominal circumference and reduced redistribution of the vital area of the brain. And also reduced amniotic fluid and rarely can be sudden placental abruption and fatal death. Next slide. Now moving on to long-term outcomes, the gestational hypertension in a future pregnancy ranges from one in eight to one in two. So if one had preeclampsia, there's a good chance they are going to get preeclampsia or hypertension, a gestational hypertension. But if they had preeclampsia, the chance of it getting again is one in six. So there's a high chance they will get it. And preeclampsia in a future pregnancy is one in four if their pregnancy was complicated by severe preeclampsia, which means severe hypertension or any one of those things like the HELP syndrome, eclampsia, and so forth. And about one in two uh, if it led to birth before 28 weeks. There may be severe preeclampsia leading to birth before 28 weeks. Now, secondly, the long-term prognosis. The data on long-term outcomes following preeclampsia suggest it's not a benign disease. It may have manifestations of cardiovascular, cerebrovascular, diabetes, cognitive dysfunction. All this can set up in the old age for the mother. Next slide. Now, this is just an important slide. You can see gestational age over 37 weeks, under 37 weeks, and you can see the long-term mortality from cardiovascular disease is eight times higher compared to uh, no preeclampsia and delivery under 37 weeks, again, slightly elevated. So preterm preeclampsia, especially under 37, and especially under 34 is of high significance. Next slide. So these are the number of um, long-term issues, stroke, thromboembolism, kidney disease, type two, neurocognitive. Seems to have some protection against cancer, but that has to be studied further. Next slide. Uh, I'll skip next slide. This is the same thing, but giving the table. This is again quite an interesting graph. The red line on the top says, if you have no preeclampsia and has a term delivery, you have a very high chance of living for 40, 50 years. If you look at the vertical scale, it is a drop by only 1%, not a dramatic drop. But you can see the orange line, if there's a preeclampsia and the preterm, then the life expectancy is about 30 to 40 years. So if the woman had a baby at 20 years, 
the life expectancy will be about 60, drastically reduced. So this is quite important that we pick up those women and give them follow-up and give antihypertensives even one year, two years, three years down the line after delivery. Because if you manage the hypertension and diabetes, then you shift the graph back to somebody who didn't have the preeclamptic process. So at the moment, what we are doing is we are delivering the babies, delivering the mothers and sending them home. But we have to find a mechanism by which either we follow up or send it to the physician. So they follow up and make sure the blood pressure is checked from time to time. Next slide. Now there's also a debate whether the preeclamptic process is like acting like a screening mechanism identifying who are likely to develop cardiovascular and diabetes, or the preeclamptic process itself might cause cardiovascular damage, and therefore they develop cardiovascular disease. And looking at studies, both seems to be the case. So they are not only precipitating or screening them out, but also they are going to cause damage, which causes the problem. So if you can avoid the damage by low-dose aspirin calcium, so much the better. The next slide. This is some work done by Basket Laganathan from St. George's and his team. And uh, what they have suggested is preeclampsia may be associated with potential for significant myocardial damage. What they did was actually to look at tissue Doppler on the myocardium, and they showed the tissue Doppler on the myocardium nowadays they can measure, shows hardly any flow. And next slide. Not only that, there is a decompensation of the ventricles and there's a septal bulge which is saying there is a resulting in increased wall stress so there are some studies interesting studies and Baskey, when he gives lectures he says preeclampsia is a cardiac disease and not a placental disease but i think it's both are true in some way but what it's important to remember not only it highlights the prognosis but also it can cause damage itself so it must be our duty not only to prevent, but also to follow these women up to late age or pass the responsibility to somebody. Least is actually to educate the mothers that they need follow of diabetes, hypertension, thyroid disorders. Next slide. Now, the long-term sequelae of preeclampsia, you know, when you ask about them, then they say, the higher rate of white matter lesions, that is in the uh, brain, there seems to be white matter lesions. There seems to be studies from America as well as from uh, Durban in South Africa, which and, and, and Pretoria from uh, the professor related there, which shows that if they do the MRI, they can see white matter lesions. And those who develop white matter lesions, many of them disappear by end of two years on an MRI. But those where it persists, those are the ones who finally develop dementia and Parkinson's and so forth. Next slide. Um, there's a busy slide, but bottom line, I can read preeclampsia may be a risk factor for permanent cerebrovascular damage. So not only I said permanent cardiovascular, but cerebrovascular damage as well. And therefore, it's a disease which has to treat, not only prevent it, but if they get it, treat it, and also long-term follow-up. Next. The offspring, which means the baby, also is supposed to develop chronic lung disease, especially if they have IUGR. Then their size of pancreas, size of liver, size of adipose don't develop. So they are unable to cope with stresses in life. So they develop subsequent pulmonary hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and stroke. And you heard about Barker hypothesis. So it's similar to that. And it is also known that it can cause uh, genetic marker disruption as well at the epigenetic level. Next slide. So this is an um, editorial which I did about 10 years ago. And uh, we looked at studies. And if you look at the right hand, the last, tip, last preterm birth associated differences as, uh, with differences in expression of metabolically important genes. So if they have even late preterm section, uh, that can give rise to epigenetic changes and they can develop to uh, problems of gastrointestinal type 1 diabetes, allergic rhinitis, all sorts of things because of epigenetic change and check change in the 
gut microbiome because you have done a C-section. Next slide. This is a continuation, but if you focus on the middle of the slide, you can see thromboembolism, hypothyroidism, and impaired memory. So it's quite important for us to really recognize that it's cardiovascular and cerebrovascular problems and also endocrine problems can set in like diabetes and hypothyroidism. And they need every six months or a year, regular checkup for life to, so that you can pick it up early and you can treat them. Next slide. So the future, we should offer women at 12 weeks a combined screening test involving uh, markers if possible. And uh, there is a study which is done at St. George's on capillary density, which seems to be a simpler way of trying to find out whether one is going to develop preeclampsia, but needs further research. Next slide. So aspirin and calcium might be, but there might be other players coming in like L-arginine and oxidant, antioxidant vitamins and probiotics. So I won't have time to go through. And there is not enough strong evidence to suggest one way or other, but I think the first line is true about aspirin and calcium. Next slide. So the learning points for my talk is uh, preeclampsia has extreme variability in presentation and severity. And severity can jump from uh, morning to evening. And so one has to be vigilant. And every year, several young and previously fit women die from preeclampsia. So we have to really, adolescent pregnancy, you have to be very careful. And once diagnosed, the disease will invariably progress. We don't know which organs will be affected, when, and how quickly it will escalate. It's difficult to predict. So we have to monitor the biochemistry and hematological parameters to find out what is happening. And the only cure is delivery. And uh, the management should be multidisciplinary. So it's not only the midwife and the obstetrician, but the anesthetist, the pediatrician should be involved and early prediction should be reproduced. Uh, that seems to be a little bit difference between the UK and the Australian researchers, but maybe in time to come. I know Dr. Sanjay Gupta is uh, uh, trying to develop some uh, bedside biochemical testing. And once it is brought to fruition, then uh, we can try to prevent it and also try to prevent long-term consequences. Next slide. So I'd like to finish with that and thank you for your patient hearing. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sabaratnam Arul Kumaran. Jerry, please take over. Uh, sorry, Niranjan, that, that broke. Uh, I couldn't hear what you were saying. Yeah, yeah. Please. So, uh, uh, JD, uh, you can uh, give your uh, expert comments and also acknowledge uh, Sir's lecture. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I could hear you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, as usual, uh, very erudite, uh, comprehensive uh, lecture. And yet, uh, despite uh, all the amount of literature that you quoted, still grounded and practical something that uh, anybody who practices obstetrics on a daily basis can use. Uh, Niranjan, I think maybe you should proceed with the uh, case discussions because I believe we are running a little behind time and uh, we don't want to deprive all those who are watching of the opportunity to gain from the expertise of Dr. P. Kesha and Dr. Shantakum. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Arul Kumaran, and uh, thank you, Jaydeep Tank. Well, we have 4,856 doctors watching us live, and the world is acknowledging the fact that the quality of FOXI Medical Disorders in Pregnancy TOG webinars are class above, and I think we are appreciated by this. And Dr. Komal Chawan, the chair, would like to thank each one of you to be present today and hear Professor Arul Kumaran from UK, London. And this thanks is from the depth of her heart for being there, hearing the webinars, and appreciating the discussions. 
we are very thankful to all of you now we go ahead with the case presentations and i request shrimon to start the screen sharing thank you so much and dr p k shah sir will be presenting his first case with a discussion where all of them will be contributing and mind you we have got more than 200 questions we will be ready with those in the meantime please enjoy the show thank you dr p k shah ha huh. ready please go ahead you can read the you can read the slide and we want me to read yes sir yes sir okay it's your case it's your uh, case 34 year old gravida 3 para 2 living on iufd1 now she is 6 weeks by dates and 6.3 weeks by ultrasound there is no history of bleeding per vagina no history of any major medical or surgical illness in obstetric history the first pregnancy she had a female 6 years old delivered by lcs in view of non progress of labor second delivery was iufd male child at 29 weeks of gestation lcs was done in view of severe preeclampsia with previous lcs and now she is gravida 3 present pregnancy next slide in last pregnancy patient had severe preeclampsia with iufd with pre monetary symptoms of dic and help syndrome she was treated but as symptoms subsided after delivery and blood pressure returned to normal no treatment was continued at home post pregnancy investigations are as follows next Uh, in blood count on the top she had hemoglobin which was 9 grams per cent platelets were low 86000 she was a negative her uh, coagulation profile everything was abnormal including bleeding time clotting time inr in biochemistry the renal function tests were abnormal or other uh, uh, slightly normal but the liver function test showed abnormalities of the enzymes ldh also uric acid was within normal limits urine analysis showed presence of epithelial cells rbcs wbcs and albumin 3 plus next slide now during this pregnancy on examination there is no pallor no edema no ictus pulse 88 per minute bp 120 70 cvs normal rs clear tns conscious well oriented or abdomen soft and i hope there was a scar of two c sections pv no active bleeding and the uterus corresponded to the weeks of amenorrhea what is the question now sir you will have to uh, summarize the case and how would you treat this case sir okay. that would be the now, best option you can you need not have this plan you can go to the previous one yes yes sir yes sir we are going back yeah, yeah. please please continue now we have a patient who is about yes. 34 years right yes sir 34 years now she has come around 6 weeks plus pregnancy with previous two lscs and rh negative and no positive finding at present either on general examination systemic examination or obstetrical examination so how do you go about so what are the questions number 1 then you can go to now questions what plan you are thinking of yes sir yes number sir one, is whether you will consider anti hypertensive therapy now or not obviously not her blood pressure is 110 70 it doesn't warrant starting any anti hypertensive therapy obviously you will ask her to come for follow up regularly like any other patient 
obviously slightly more because of previous two LACS. And every time monitor our blood pressure and do urine albumin. Rule out chronic hypertension by USG, KUB and renal artery, no, in, not in this patient because she did not have chronic hypertension and now she is normotensive. So there is no need of kidney, ureter, bladder, ultrasound or renal artery Doppler. As such, renal artery Doppler is contraindicated during pregnancy. You can do her routine blood investigation like hemoglobin, blood group, VDRL, urine, albumin, HIV, T3, T4, TSH, etc. And you may go for, because after the last post delivery investigations, we do not have any other thing available to us. You can go for liver function and kidney function. What is most important now, because she will ask you, what are my chances of getting the same problem in this pregnancy? So you will call her for ultrasonography anytime around 12 weeks, 13 weeks, 14 weeks, and do a thorough ultrasonography, like how we do between in 11 to 13.6 weeks scan. But more importantly, you have to predict whether she is likely to get preeclampsia or not. You can do a uterine artery around artery Doppler and see what is the PI. We have a charts available now that tell you what should be the range of PI at various weeks of gestation from 11 weeks onwards. You have to see that the PI of umbilical artery on both the sides is between 5th to 95th percentile. If it is more, more than 95th percentile, then her chances of getting preeclampsia later on is around 43%. It falls positive of 5% because we are doing it in first trimester. You will repeat this uterine artery Doppler later on around 22, 23, 24 weeks and see whether the uterine artery Doppler is showing you abnormal PI for that period of gestation. So that will give you a likelihood of getting preeclampsia later on to around 70%, 60 to 70%. But now I will call her first around 12 weeks or so and irrespective of what is the uterine artery Doppler, I'll put her on acetyl salicylic acid, that is aspirin, 150 milligram from 12th week onwards. It should be started before 16th week of gestation for it to have any effect on patient getting preeclampsia. You should start around 150 milligram of aspirin and then have a regular follow-up in this patient do ultrasound again at 20 to 23 weeks. Basically, again for anomaly scan and uterine artery on both the sides and go for umbilical artery scan at that point of time to see along with middle cerebral artery. Never ever do only umbilical artery. Always do along with middle cerebral artery and see whether they fall into normal range for that period of gestation or not. Next. Next slide. Okay. So we will start after about 12 weeks the hematinex and calcium should be given more than 1000 milligram. You can have a pr product which has both elemental zinc also in addition to iron and calcium, you can give vitamin D around 2000 international units daily orally in divided doses. And you can give B complex orally, especially in active form like methylcobin, iridoxin to reduce the risk of abruption. If at all, she gets preeclampsia later on. Anything else? Sir, how will you manage her now once she comes in the third trimester and then in labor in such conditions? Third trimester? 
the same patient. Obviously, we will have to see what is the blood pressure. If her blood pressure is within normal limits, she will go like any other normal patient who does not have preeclampsia. Depending on what is the severity of preeclampsia, whether it is a mild, moderate or severe blood pressure that she has got, we will have to deliver by about 38 weeks if she has mild preeclampsia. And even earlier, depending on what is the blood pressure, what are her symptoms and what are the Doppler findings. So Doppler findings will decide the time of delivery for these patients. If you get in any patient, the umbilical artery showing you absent endiastolic flow or reversal of endiastolic flow, that is the time when you should think of delivering her. If you do not have a good neonatal intensive backup, refer her to a higher center that is NICU backup. Because in utero transfer for this such fetus is very good rather than delivering at your place and then transferring the neonate in a NICU outside. So that is one thing. If she has got a severe preeclampsia, we are not going to wait because we will do not only umbilical artery doppler, medial cerebral, but also the ductus venosus. You don't wait till ductus venosus becomes abnormal. So you have one more vessel that you can study, the isthmus of aorta, so that shows you changes one week before the ductus venosus. So if you get ductus uh, uh, aorta, isthmus of aorta showing you reversal of waves, that is a time when you should immediately try and deliver this patient. You wait till ductus venous is showing you reversal of A waves below the baseline. It might be too late. You may get the baby out live, but you do not know about the morbidity and all the complications that Professor Arul Kumaran told you. You might be very happy doing C-section on such patients. So don't wait till ductus venous shows you abnormalities. You have to decide and deliver this patient. If Abgar score, or uh, rather Bishop score is uh, favorable, you can go for induction and deliver. But don't have a very prolonged induction delivery interval in these patients. You have to monitor both mother as well as the fetus very regularly. And C-section should be done very liberally in these patients in case you find the fetus is in distress or even the mother is in distress. Wonderful, sir. The way you have explained as if I am sitting in a class and hearing an ultimate professor and sir, I never interrupted you. You have really wonderfully explained the journey of a 32, 34 year old woman with one IUFD and one previous LSES. Now she is just looking to have a wonderful baby, but she is worried. And how will you go about in the first trimester, second, third trimester, and in labor? Yes, sir. Please. Yes, sir. Yes. Some so early in pregnancy, it is your responsibility as obstetrician to counsel her and her close relatives, including husband, so that they understand what is the situation. Otherwise, all throughout the pregnancy, they remain under stress that any time she may go into eclampsia and she may get convulsions. So you have to do proper counseling. Tell her what exactly you are going to do all throughout pregnancy, how you are going to monitor, what is ultrasound, what is non-stress case, what is fetal biophysical profile. Must explain to her and tell her at what period of gestation you will do what. Once she understands, she will have more faith in you and she will come religiously for follow-up. And if she has been told about symptoms of Eclampsia and even imminent eclampsia, she will come immediately because these are the patients who are really worried and you must counsel them properly. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Blessed are those who get to hear such tall words like you and Professor Arul Kumaran and Jaydeep. And we have got more than 5,188 users logged in. 
and we are still to go with the next case and i request dr shanta kumari madam to please start her case there are many many questions coming but we will take the questions later okay thank you niranjan yes i think uh, when we heard uh, arul sir we felt so nice you know we miss sir it's been uh, more than 3 months we missed having him in vizac in march hope to see him soon thank you and uh, yes pk shaw sir has so nicely uh, shown us through the case how we need to manage now coming to this case you are, there is a 29 year old second gravida paravan living one who came to the labor room at 28 weeks she is complaining of severe headache and blurred vision but she can perceive the fetal movements there is no history of any pervaginal leak or no bleeding so when you go into the history she is a paravan living one th- 3 years back she delivered a female vaginally and now she is the second gravida in the present pregnancy her bp was normal throughout the anc and there was no other uh, pre pregnancy issues after the first normal delivery now this particular case there is one very important point you should note the bp was normal throughout anc checkup now we have to be very sure that the blood pressure was checked properly in the previous ancs which is very very vital can i have the next slide please yes so on examination there was no pallor no ictus there was bilateral pedal edema then the most important when the bp was checked is 200 by 110 mm with 2 plus proteinuria which was done uh, and her cardiovascular respiratory system was normal uterus was around uh, 26 weeks gestation cephalic fetal heart is still there 138 regular and pelvic examination showed os was closed cervix unaffected no show no leak now what is it that we are having in our hand we have a 28 uh, week week her with very high blood pressure 200 by 110 with an obviously normal blood pressure before so is it a typical pih patient which has presented to you but remember she is having headache so you are worried when she has high blood pressure and headache you are worried whether she may throw a fit you got a patient with Im- probably and preeclampsia with now in imminent ec- uh, eclampsia so she may any time throw a fit that's what you are worried about can i have the so what is it that we are going to do for this patient so as soon as i see this patient i expect whoever is my resident to see this patient the first priority should be to start mobilizing along with the investigations to see to bring down the blood pressure but not in a very abrupt fashion try to bring down the blood pressure very uh, nicely so that the bp gets reduced little by little and the most important part is she's got a headache so at the same time we are worried so what is it then we have to think about we need to give her the magnesium sulfate prophylaxis also can i have the next slide uh, please so we'll have to think about in these uh, t- uh, terms and meanwhile the investigations have come though she was not looking anemic her hemoglobin was only 2.8 9.8 grams and the total count was 8200 platelet was normal lft and rft are within normal limits fundoscopy is also within normal limits so everything other than the blood pressure is abnormal or rightly on the anemic side so what is it that we need to do for this particular woman yeah so our our first point should be now to reduce the blood pressure so what is it that i have on my hand that i'm going to give to this patient can i have have the next slide please so what is the drug of choice for this patient now i'm sure all of you will agree that we would like to start her on iv labitalol and see that the blood pressure will be reduced now how is it that you are starting the labitalol when we start an iv uh, labitalol we have to give her about 20 mg iv slowly over 2 minutes and then monitor the patient if the blood pressure is not reg- uh, uh, reducing you can step up your iv labitalol and up to a maximum dose of 300 mg so don't keep on loading the patient with labitalol be careful with the amount of drug any drug you are going to give don't be in a panic panic sister will be getting one resident will be getting one consultant will tell something on the telephone but please be sure of what are the drugs you are giving to the patient meanwhile you stabilize the blood pressure 
and now this magnesium sulfate what is the role one side is we are looking at it as trying to be a neuroprotective active and at the same time we are worried about whether she may throw a fit imminent eclampsia so we want to counter that that's why we use magnesium sulfate and now yes all of us everywhere the whole country we are very clear in our magnesium sulfate uh, dosage along with it she is only about 28 weeks and per abdomen 26 weeks so naturally i would like to give her steroids for lung maturation because if i have to deliver her if her blood pressure is not getting uh, reduced and if she continues to have headache and if you are worried by whether she may have eclampsia then i may have to deliver her so obviously steroids are an important part of the management so some people may argue she is already in having so much uh, blood pressure she is in the labor room now and any time you may terminate why do you want to give steroids but you never know whatever little amount of time that steroid is going to be there it may act so there's no harm please don't withhold the steroid go ahead and give the steroids and if you are lucky your pk show is also there so i am very happy elder sir please do this ultrasound he will do a doppler and he was going to give me the findings and meanwhile if the blood pressure gets controlled okay but if bp is not getting controlled and all the symptoms are increasing now what do we do naturally i'll have to think of termination of the pregnancy pikesha sir is looking at me don't you agree with me sir yeah that we have i think now then sada the other uh, uh, resident may say madam she is only 28 weeks how can you terminate her but remember in spite of giving the treatment if the blood pressure is not getting reduced and if there are signs and symptoms of imminent eclampsia and any time if the worsening of symptoms please don't think only of that present gestational age we'll have to think of trying to save the mother also so that we do not have other comorbidity so that is very important and that is where your uh, idea of termination of pregnancy should come so can we go to the next slide so this particular patient whether if we are lucky we would be able to contain the blood pressure if i have been very lucky with my antihypertensives but the blood pressure has come down and if uh, the magnesium sulfate i have given so our headache is gone then what do i do i can wait and prolong the pregnancy for some more time because all the rest of the parameters are quite normal all the blood parameters are within normal range so that is a positive point but if yes. everything is controlled we need to be very cautious and monitoring all the blood levels everything then only i should plan you yes. should plan to continue the pregnancy under watchful expectancy at any given point if there is something going wrong then we will have to plan to terminate the pregnancy so that's it niranjan so yes. that's how i think this particular case needs to be managed yes yes madam wonderfully explained i think the young generation then I, can i ask one thing at this junction i would like to ask our uh, arul kumaran sir sir do you think that doing the glycosylated fibronectin for these sort of uh, women who are coming with this uh, sudden uh, rise in blood pressure where obviously all the ancs were normal could have helped as a no. trying the glycosylated no, think- fibronectin that is no no i don't, I don't so, think it is is going to help because i think your your worry is actually the mother might suddenly throw a fit or develop a cerebral hemorrhage so i think the mother comes first so the additional investigations are not going to help in your management can i can i i just see the the only point is when we are doing the routine antenatal uh, checkup if we want to pick up the pih cases probably we could have done it antenatally the protein biomarker and that could have given us an indication if this patient was going to have this so retrospectively could we have done it yeah to pick up well, i think the the reality is actually um um one is prediction the yes. other one is prevention the yes. one other one is early diagnosis and early treatment yes. so for preeclampsia actually the biomarkers and other things have certain amount of positive and negative predictive value and so on so it might help in some way but the overriding factor is actually your clinical acumen 
that's the overriding factor all of you have heard the very important statement whatever you are talking about the biomarkers whatever you are talking about the blood investigation clinically when you examine the patient then at that time what are the blood levels and all that should actually make you decide on your plan of management so that is some yeah. something which is very very vital for this particular patient so accordingly if we are we should manage this particular patient yes sir uh, thank you uh, thank you uh, dr shanta it was a wonderful presentation you have taken us through and i agree with dr uh, pikesha also that we need to terminate such pregnancies irrespective of 28 weeks which we are seeing and obviously there are a lot of uh, you know now indicators and predictive uh, uh, situation i think dr komal can also uh, highlight a few points if you are there dr komal Yes, like yes, I'm there. Yeah. yeah, it was a very nice uh, talk by Arul Kumaran sir, and it was so wonderfully explained about the preeclampsia and what are the risk factors, the management, and two cases very nicely. It is uh, discussed step by step in a simple manner. You know, when we get such patients in emergency, a person panics. But when we this is explained in a simple manner, not to panic, and how to go about in a systematic manner when it is put up. that actually gives us an insight what to do next you know we know that from these experienced speakers what they have said so it is all very rightly said and very nicely and so many questions are coming and i just want to add on one question which sounds interesting never anybody has asked such a question so it is interesting to me and uh, we all agreed about the role of aspirin and dr bhageshri chitre she is asking that we know that preeclampsia is mostly seen in primary gravidas so is it prudent to start aspirin in all primary gravidas is our question so how do we justify if our obstetrician come up with such a question sir so anybody dr pikesha you can take this question you know the situation is very simple like when we were talking about torch infection the diagnosis by asking the patient to undergo investigation patient would shell out lot of money and people thought that why not treat her mm-hmm. just like that and if you do so if you have not proven the diagnosis and you give prophylactically treatment and something goes wrong then you are into medical legal problems mm-hmm. so similar situation is here that there are many uh, papers that we have now available that you can go for aspirin in only patients who have positive history like preeclampsia family history previous pre preterm birth or even previous preeclampsia eclampsia so if you have any indication for starting aspirin in pregnancy as early as end of first trimester till 30 end of 37th week there is no indication that you can give in all primaries preeclampsia primaries to prevent preeclampsia because aspirin with 150 mg daily is not out of danger totally it can have its own complications so you have to be very careful before empirically given aspirin to all primaries professor arul kumar yes yes sir yes what about what about dr arul sir well we don't give to all primaries the the first thing to do is actually to see her age uh, as well mm-hmm. as the uh, body mass index family history and so on like professor pk sha mentioned so if that's a family history the mother or sister had if she is obese or if she is elderly then i think there is a reasonable grounds to start not to all primary gravids if she is 25 26 and she is uh, no problems of a good body mass index then the risk you pose of cerebral and gastrointestinal bleeds are there so i think you have to select out those who are most likely to benefit and give them yes so it's very rightly sir yes. very clearly Shanta, there is no universal recommendation very yes clear. yes very thank you very much now one more question when even the, we know that the iv labetalol bolus and infusion drip has not reduced the blood pressure and hydrolyzine we know is a drug but it isn't available uh, depin is what people use but sometimes it doesn't work 
so then can we give dioxide dioxide 30 mg every 5 minutes in a in ward this is from dr pradeep one minute so, yes sir sir you can take Okay, if you are given first, Shanta Madam, first time the shot of labetalol IV, hmm. and if it has not worked, you can double the dose after ten yeah. minutes and give it. Yes. Don't go in a day beyond three hundred milligram. Please remember this. So you can double the dose and give it after ten minutes or so. Do not change over to something which we are not used to. Yeah. The other thing available is hydrolyzing. That can be utilized five milligram IV bolus. And that also can be repeated if it is not effective initially. In uh, hospitals like AEM Hospital and Sion Hospital, where we intensive care units, people are asked for nitroglycerin drip if the blood pressure has not come under control with IV antihypertensive. Please remember this. So that can be done, but you need uh, ICU supervision if you have to give mm -hmm. nitroglycerin drip to. Bring down the blood pressure in a given situation. Yes, uh, Shanta, madam, do you want to add something? Or you agree what sir said? Sir has very clearly told that, and uh, most of the times, many of the bigger hospital have hydrolyzine, so they'll be managed. But the thing is, don't be in a hurry. Don't give multiple yeah. drugs. That is very important. Stick yeah, because be a but, little cautious. Because what happens I, is we find is people give a cocktail of drugs, and that actually yeah. results in. All the peri, I mean, all the perinatal morbidity and uh, mortality. Yeah. That's what okay. happened. Because because, because the question was specified that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The yes. peak time for labetalol is half an hour actually. Yeah. So if you keep loading the patient with yeah. labetalol, she may go into hypotension. So at times you have to be careful and decide, even in an individual case, whether you need to give it within ten minutes. Or you can wait till half an hour and double the dose and give it. Okay. Perfect. Yes. So definitely, when the management was be uh, to be done in the ward, one has to be really cautious and not to give because the question specifically was in the ward, and one should stick but, to single but, drug. Komal, when a patient is having severe PIH, very high blood pressure, why do you want to keep her? You can maybe shift her to the labor room or labor ward. Yeah. Or labor ward, or into then, uh, yeah, where there will be more close monitoring. That's very important. Yes. So the next question is from Dr. Tresa Menon uh, to you, Dr. Shanta Kumari, Madam. Does high dose vitamin D three, two thousand international unit, and elemental calcium five hundred mg helps to prevent spontaneous abortion and preterm delivery? See. There are a lot of studies which are uh, which have come forward and said uh, there was a time about 15 years back we really didn't talk about vitamin D. We thought we Indians had a lot of vitamin D. Everyone had vitamin D, and suddenly vitamin D came up and it became the Jinda Talismat. Jinda Talismat we have in our old city. It is used from headache to stomach ache to body ache to infertility to earache everything. But that's what happened to vitamin. D. I hope it is not used for COVID. Probably it's being used. <laughs> 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 so we uh, but there are lot of studies which have shown that we indians are deficient in vitamin d and obviously we thought probably our dark skin and non exposure to the sun we are all sitting in the inside the opd or inside the house you know but you go out when the sun has not really come out and then when you by time you come back sun has already gone mm -hmm. so that yes. could be also then lot of studies have also shown that vitamin d and calcium Are beneficial in trying to reduce the preeclampsia and PIH. So, in that background, so probably these are the drugs which are helping, and we definitely know now. Yes, calcium is very vital for even uh, to some extent to red to contain this preeclampsia. Also, a lot of studies have there been there. So we have, and anyway, calcium is needed in pregnancy also. So it's a it's, it's, a, right. it's no harm. It is nothing new. pregnancy does need calcium and probably the diet is not giving the adequate calcium which is needed yes very rightly said madam and very nicely explained now this is a, a question from dr santosh shukla uh, to you arul sir uh, he says sir have you have highlighted that patient with preeclampsia has a eight fold high risk of death from cvd what would be the postnatal care and long term supplementation recommended for this patient 
to avoid future risk well the the answer is actually anyone with uh, preeclampsia especially they are developed under 34 weeks on the long run they will develop hypertension in pregnancy so the only way to avoid it is actually to go for regular blood pressure checkup and it is also known that they can develop diabetes thyroid disease and so on so if they go regular checkup for diabetes and hypertension at least you can avoid the woman getting a cerebrovascular accident so it's nothing uh, it can be avoided but it needs regular checkup and if the blood pressure goes a uh, proper treatment yes thank you sir shanta madam you want to add something uh, no the previous question when we were just talking uh, about labetalol and blood pressure was not con uh, getting contained there was one study sir which was done by professor radha in vizac it was uh, published also that there was a rct where nifedipine and uh, labetalol were studied and women who were conscious and alert who were not unconscious and all so when they didn't respond to the labetalol nifedipine was actually given as an alternative and they usually responded this was one of the studies so you can remember that these are simpler drugs than the dioxide or some of the drugs which yeah. actually i have never used that i don't know if pk yes. has used i we have not used it in our setup so we have to use drugs where which we are used to and about the action and the positive and negative aspects of the drug before using the drug yes very rightly said now uh, aspirin questions are flowing in and there is one question from dr megha kavlapurkar she is writing so we know that a patient having a history of previous history of preeclampsia and previous pregnancy should we start aspirin at the first visit or decide by uterine artery doppler or biochemistry at 11 to 14 weeks we can so you need not wait for the ultrasound doppler to tell you that you should start once she has a history of preeclampsia and previous pregnancy you should start aspirin any time immediately after the first trimester now there are uh, obstetricians who say that you can start any time even in first trimester i'm slightly worried but you have to start it before 16th week if that patient presents to you for the first time with this history after 16th week of gestation it is not going to do anything good to the patient because already there is a failure of invasion of trophoblast of spiral arteries yes. and now it is not going to work in favor of the patient you have to be careful at what time she comes to you for the first time yes very very uh, rightly answered and there are so many questions on as aspirin more or less asking when to start and sir has given the answer this question is to professor arul sir this is from dr archana vasir our vice president of foxy what strategy you suggest in first trimester screening for pre eclampsia in indian scenario well, as i mentioned the american college papers delegate that uh, the history about and also the clinical examination about her age her weight the bmi previous history mother's history sister's history those are quite important the biochemistry itself is not going to add very much if you don't have facilities to do that if you have the facilities then you can do that it might add more and i think i showed a slide of dr kolka which shows high sensitivity of measuring three or four biochemical markers but i wouldn't worry too much if i if you are very careful in taking history asking for mother's history sister's history her age her bmi then we should be able to come to some conclusion whether we should start on aspirin or not that's the okay. american college recommendation okay. yes doctor pk shah can i say something yes sir uh, there are papers that have shown importance of four five factors in first trimester one is the detail history as professor arun kumar has showed second thing is the mean arterial pressure that is the mean arterial pressure is more than 90 mm of mercury during first trimester it may give you some idea that the patient is likely to get preeclampsia later on the third thing is uterine artery that we have discussed the pi of uterine artery and the fourth thing the biochemical markers <clears throat> in our country at least in major cities like mumbai we have now facility 
for pack A, which we have been doing, obviously. Number two is placental growth factor. Number three is <clears throat> soluble FMs like tyrosine kinase, S-split. Even that facilities are available. And when you combine these four factors, the history, mean arterial pressure, uterine artery EPI, and the first trimester biochemical markers, you may have an added advantage of getting better sensitivity compared to doing only Doppler and history. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shanta. So, uh, I would request uh, each of the panelists and uh, speaker to give a take-home message in uh, managing this preeclampsia and eclampsia cases and uh, your take on that and then we'll close the session. Please, Dr. Arul. Well, my point is actually that uh, this is a disease which uh, identifies who are likely for people to develop problems later and the disease itself can cause problems. So they should have a follow-up, lifelong follow-up of their blood sugar, blood pressure and treated accordingly so that they can have a normal lifespan. Yes, Dr. Shah. Yeah, I think you should not take preeclampsia lightly at all. As Professor Arun Kumar showed, what are the effects later on in life of both mother as well as the fetus? You must try and prevent as far as possible by starting your monitoring from first trimester. We have shifted from second trimester to first trimester. And this is very important that you try and do all this and go into the thorough history. Doctors don't have time, obstetricians don't find time to go into this history, especially for PIH. So please spare more time with these patients. That will really help them live longer and even free of some of the conditions that they may get later on after delivery for themselves and even for the children. Yes, sir. Dr. Shant. Yeah, I think uh, uh, Professor Arul Kumaran and P.K. Shaw, sir, have so rightly put it. There's a, the PIH, this preeclampsia is, a, is the main killer nowadays. People are talking of PPH, PPH, PPH and other things. But friends, remember, PIH is the new age syndrome. We have to actually conquer this to reduce the maternal morbidity mortality to reach the SDG goals. And simple measures, correct uh, measurement of blood pressure, please make sure that whoever is checking the blood pressure is trained properly to check the proper blood pressure. This simple intervention can go a very long way in trying to actually reduce the morbidity and mortality. It may sound very simple. It may sound very silly also, but I feel, sir, this is the most neglected thing which I think every one of us have. Because we all think somebody will see the BPN. So please look into that. I'm sure Jaydeep will agree to me. Though. Uh, thank you, Shanta. It's very rare that I disagree with you in the first place. So of course, I agree with you. Uh, I think uh, a take-home message for me would be that, uh, of course, one needs to be careful. And of course, one needs to do screening and prophylaxis and prevention and so on and so forth. But for me, what is emblematic about preeclampsia and the prediction of PIH, preeclampsia and eclampsia for that matter, is the fact that there is no sure shot way of doing it. And I think that is where when we are counseling the patients, we need to be extraordinarily careful and we need to be extraordinarily careful in two respects. We need to be careful to tell them that there is no accurate or 100% way of predicting whether they will get preeclampsia or PIH. And while giving them information, we also have to be extremely careful not to scare them. And I think this is something, uh, a big dilemma which I face in clinical practice. Patients want information, but after you give them all the information, they may turn around and tell you, well, you know, I, I was actually happy not knowing this because now that I know all this, I'm scared. And I think that is uh, something which we always have to keep in mind. So for example, you do a test 
and the chances that she will develop preeclampsia on the basis of that test yeah. are maybe 40% or 50% or 60%. You have to tell her that although your chances are that 40% of the time you'll develop preeclampsia, also remember that 60% of the time you won't develop it. So for me, I think a balanced approach uh, to any therapeutic intervention, be it a test for making a prediction, be it a test for making a prognosis, or uh, any pharmaceutical intervention I do, has to be tinged with this reality that at the end of the day, we really don't know whether what we are doing is going to be 100% effective or not. And also, I think I would look at it not only from the glass half full, uh, half empty perspective, I would look at it from the glass half full perspective by saying that we fortunately have very good interventions now, which can reduce uh, the morbidity of preeclampsia and most certainly either prevent or reduce the morbidity and mortality from eclampsia. So again, thank you Niranjan and Komal for having me. It was a real pleasure listening to Prof. Arul as always. And of course, Dr. P.K. Shah, who was my examiner in MD, and Dr. Shanta Kumari. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jaiji. Uh, there is one yes. small point, you know. We were talking about all the, this thing. The, the women who have uh, uh, this blood pressure and this PIH and all, there's one study which has come out. A baseline uh, eco is very important. That baseline eco is one which can actually be used as a predictor for uh, catching or picking up the pul pulmonary edema and such things. So I think in these setups, if you have the facility, you should go ahead and do a baseline echo in these high-risk women. It is not a mandatory or an, like a an, uh, guideline or something, but there are a lot, lot of studies which have shown that this will help us in better management. So I just wanted to add this because... Thank you, uh, all of you. The young gynex of this country should take these opportunities to update themselves when they get to hear and learn from such gold mines of knowledge. And it is just very simple. You just click and log in and you are at it. And today we crossed more than 5,200 users who logged in and took that opportunity. And we are very grateful to Dr. Savarandanam Arun Kumaran to be there. Opportunity to learn will never come back. We at this age also are like students and I respect students that they should take this opportunity. Knowledge is gold mine. Knowledge is power. And they say pen is mightier than sword. And if allowed, I can say knowledge is the sword and you can sharpen it every day. And thank you, Foxy. We have got 36,000 gynecologists and obstetrician practicing our COVID warriors. And in spite of all these times, they are still logged in to hear Dr. Arul and Dr. P. Kesha, Dr. Shanta Madam, and obviously Dr. Jaydeep Tang, the Secretary General. Thank you, Dr. Komal. I would like to thank TOG team, Subbu, Meenal, Srimon, and our sponsors, mayors, the new kid on the block, the calcium, vitamin D, and zinc. And obviously, even RCOG guidelines say that calcium, when given, is surely going to make a lot of difference for these patients of preeclampsia. There are many questions which are being there, but we will have to stop now. And we have 36,000 doctors, and this nation has to use this information. So please do log in. Thank you, all of you. Have a great time. See you soon.